Hey everyone, welcome to Alpaca's 34th Fireside Chat. Here we cover everything in crypto, DeFi, NFTs, and GameFi. And then what we'll do is we'll move on to Alpaca Q&A. So Q&A can come from the, the audience. When we move to Q&A, if you have a question, just click the bottom left-hand mic button on the Twitter app. It has to be on mobile. If we don't get questions, then we'll move on to the Ask Alpaca Bank, which is questions we've compiled over the last couple of weeks from the community and mods. I'm sure everyone at the moment is sort of watching the market. Anyone, to be fair, that's been in the market or deployed in the market since Jan pretty well across the board has done fairly well. I think in particular yesterday we had the FOMC meeting. So there was the 25 basis points rate hike with, I would say, fairly like dovish stance on, you know, the markets and sort of the tools that the Fed has at hand at the moment and to potentially move towards sort of a soft landing. And I think even prior to this, and we kind of expected these numbers to come out, is that at least the people left in crypto at the moment feel pretty well, like fully risk on, at least like the people that are in, in crypto. There is still, we, we had a, a news article shared in turn this morning that there's still in terms of institutional capital in crypto, a lot of that is sidelined or has been effectively removed from the market across this year. Obviously that can change, but for the most part, traders or large capital sources are kind of putting a stopper on it. And this is to be fair, the same as traditional markets. I was reading an article yesterday saying that like the large majority of capital is basically sitting there, I'm sidelined. So it, it kind of it was a question for me and just generally is like, you know, how long does this rally continue? You know, what we saw kind of 2020 and 2021 was kind of spurred through, I would say, mechanisms in COVID and people being at home, but generally a lot of fresh capital that had come into the market. And I don't think we're, we're there quite yet especially across this year you have like generally okay or well worsening macro conditions in the sense of layoffs i would say for for large companies but generally labor market's still quite tight which means people remain you know in their job but interest rates are still high and, and asset prices are still high i guess the one thing you could argue is that with the with the hammering cryptos taken those asset prices have you know fell by a, a fair amount when compared to traditional assets but you know looking looking at this market one one question i was asking myself which you're kind of seeing at the moment is that you kind of have a blend of like the new versus the old in terms of projects so We've seen things like, you know, DYDX, for example, there was meant to be a huge unlock and basically now, and that's been pushed to December, you see other projects doing new product releases and, and token revamps. And I think the one question I have, and I'll, I'll pass it across to you, Sam, is that typically in these markets or in crypto, like the new shiny tokens sort of outperform, you know, the older products that have been in the market and people are going through revamps, but in particular with all the things that have happened over the last year in terms of hacks and centralized kind of meltdowns, you, you'd see a, a more sustainable model coming in with, I guess, existing teams are effectively proven. But Sam, what do you think? Do you think with existing teams sort of rolling out new products and still shipping and revamping tokenomics, do they hold up against the new shiny tokens that will kind of come out the market in you know, say the next like year or so? Well, I think it's just a question of volatility and just like principles of math. So when you have new tokens, they're going to have lower liquidity. They're going to generally start at a lower price. And so they have the potential to go up more, but they also have the potential to crash as faster than they rose because they're not proven as far as security, as far as product market fit most of the time they're going to collapse, right? So you have to be really like a bit of a wizard. And in practice, really, it, you need to have private information is really how a lot of the insiders called the top by selling the top. So, I mean, some people like to do that, right? Those are a lot of the people that in the current market, you know, bet on like meme coins and stuff like that. And a lot of them just got completely hammered. And even if you say that if you were in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum, that you're not, you know, doing bad, you didn't lose 99% of your net worth by betting on new tokens like that. So it's really just a different kind of offer, I would say. It's obviously the case that if you have a token that's already been up and down, it's going to be more subtle. Just 
just like in the stock market, you can bet on blue chips and you can bet on penny stocks. And maybe if you're very, very good on penny stocks, you can make more just because the volatility is higher at the same time. If you're not extremely careful with your risk management, you're just, you could lose everything overnight. So it's not really special. I would say it's the same across all markets. It's been the same for all previous cycles here. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to what kind of investor and trader you are. If you are the type that you want to set alarms for yourself in the middle of the night to wake you up because that's the type of awareness and management, active management you need to be able to deal with these volatile types of assets. And ideally, you are clipped into information faster than other people. Whereas if you invest in blue chips, if you invest in tokens, proven teams that have had solid security for years on end, you're really at that point, like in stocks, for example, you're kind of investing in getting dividends or you're investing in not looking for those huge returns, right? Because you also are looking for a maximum loss that's available. So, you know, if you're working like we are and you have a day job, essentially working in crypto, then you shouldn't have time to be a day trader or an, an hour trader, really. So for people like me, I'm really looking for more stable types of assets, to invest in. Maybe if you have a relatively small portfolio and you can risk losing everything and you have free time, then yeah, like hunt down new narratives and stuff like that. That could be what makes sense for you personally, you know, but it's really just like that. And I think the question in this market is it's obviously as some people feel like they got a little bit of room to breathe, but I mean, I'm looking at the one day chart and it's, we're pretty much still in range. Like Today, I woke up and saw Bitcoin crack 24, but it got pounded back down to 23.5. So we're still in the same range that we have been in for the past like week and a half. But I think the question is still the one that we touched on last week is, is the crypto cartel propping up the market or is there real demand? You know, Pete, you asked like, with all of the liquidations coming from bankruptcies and stuff like that, are some entities just sort of helping the prices rise so that they can have a better price to release their liquidity on or their inventory? So, yeah, I don't know. I haven't been paying too much about this. This is obviously like an old kind of ghost story within crypto. And you hear this all the time. Most recently, you heard this with like instance B tokens that they were essentially like printing USD so that they can buy BNB and stuff like that. And I haven't seen any proof of that, but you hear this kind of story. I think there, the one that was legitimate was Tether when back in the day when you could always see that Tether was essentially minting more USDT so that they could buy on the market. And it wasn't clear if their strategy was really to bring crypto assets up. It certainly was the case that you saw this pattern, right? So Pete, have you seen this with Circle, Paxos, and Tether in this recent week or two? Yeah, like there has been more. That's been sort of like the mem going around, right? Is that, you know, the in quotations cartel is sort of propping up this market. And primarily what that is coming from is like large stablecoin mints coming from treasuries of, you know, Paxos, which is, you know, BUSD or Circle and Tether, which you could probably make the argument that from, let's say, December time, so I'm looking at the chart right now, like you had roughly, let's say, BUSD, which did have a, like a big rise in market cap when they consolidated stable coins on Binance, kind of the, the latter bit of last year. But you did have a huge drop come like middle December from about a market cap of call it 22 billion, and then just like a steep drop down to about 18 and a half, right? So you have about, call it 4 billion, give or take, and that kind of bled out to a low of like 15 and a half, right? So within a very short period of time, it had a lot of redemptions. So that typically how that works, if I want to effectively, if I'm a large player and I want to, you know, exit the market, I can go directly to these issuers and you know, burn the stable coin and redeem the cash directly from the minter, right? So, you know, I would argue that if you're looking at the market cap of a, you know, of a stable coin that's dropped fairly dramatically, then that's probably not the case. And I think people are looking for some kind of story or conspiracy theory. But realistically, I think a lot of people just risked off over December as either just personally or because they were structured to do so and then have kind of been inching back in, especially when 
you know, the majority of crypto has been, you know, hammered down anywhere from, you know, 99.9%. I think that the least I've seen is maybe 60 or 70%. So I really think that's the case. You're just seeing sort of flows that, that are required to bring the market cap back up. But it is, you know, interesting narrative nonetheless. But there is a good amount of, you know, momentum on the point of just the amount of sideline capital across the board. It would you know, basically echoes towards me that it's not so much a trap per se, but I think when the mentality moves from like, you know, PTSD to a point of an up only market in a very short period of time, that's when, you know, pain could potentially happen when people do fully risk on and kind of forget about, you know, what's where we still are generally. So that's something I wanted to cover because, I think that's sort of like the mental model everyone needs to be in if you are sort of risk on in this market or hunting these things out is that, you know, the majority of, let's say, capital sources are still cautious, both from traditional and crypto perspective. If we flip from, to be fair, you know, the last year has been pretty bad and and we still have, like, I'll take one, for example, we have like a Genesis, right, which just happened and you also have dcg which is, is obviously tied to that and there's you know what one point something billion of a bad debt in between you know those you know parent sister companies and the one thing i saw last week was they want to basically resolve the bankruptcy proceedings of genesis quickly which what does that mean effectively for the market no idea does that mean they need to liquidate very quickly to settle redemptions or withdrawals Potentially, you know, it is something to keep in mind that there is a lot of pent up, call it crypto or capital that is just waiting on a release, which could take months, it could take years. But yeah, my, my feeling in this sort of market is that, you know, you, you could wake up one day and, you know, it could be it could be <laughs> it could be a completely different scenario. But yeah, mentally, I think it's just, you know, if, if that if the switch flicks from you know you know reality to peak euphoria very quickly then that that could be that could be dangerous but who knows it is hard to say generally but the other thing i'm tracking at the moment is just you know generally where DeFi is going so i think like internally we look at obviously where the next wave of users is going to come from there's a big push that sam's working on in terms of the gaming side of the business and what's being done on different chains and DeFi is that i think perps obviously has found a like a really great product market fit because it's very easy to understand you can take a directional on the market and it's effectively one click but as we get as DeFi in general gets more advanced or more mature we start seeing, I'd say, more advanced products come to market. So you have a lot of options protocols coming on chain now. You have trading volatility, so like a gamma swap, which I haven't had time to dig into, but you're basically trading IL in a positive direction in terms of volatility. But you know, I think that's great in terms of the advancement of DeFi, but does it really capture the new users coming in? And if it doesn't capture new users, then we're kind of waiting on the more sophisticated, I'd say traders to move their operations on chain. We'll take perps as an example is, you know, perps are moving more on chain, but you know, things like liquidity and execution and cost are still gonna be prohibitive as they are now for the mass majority to come on in terms of, let's say, institutions, right? But yeah, Sam, what are you seeing in terms of like the DeFi models are coming out? And do you feel like we're getting too advanced for new users to adopt this? Well, I wouldn't say they're getting too advanced for new users. I would say that these products aren't for new users in the first place, right? So the fact is that DeFi across the board just has much harder, the user experience just isn't simple enough for a lot of new users that aren't accustomed. And this was even the case really for me. Like, you know, I, I was working in crypto for years before I really started using DeFi. And that still being the case, it wasn't like a simple type of one step one, step two type of process to try to understand exactly how to interact with Ethereum protocols and, you know, how to start keeping my money within smart contracts. Like that type of UX just isn't very intuitive right now. It doesn't matter who you are. So, but the thing is that this is not some sort of like mystical problem. This is a problem that 
a lot of people that are working on products most people are aware of. And the reason it hasn't really been fixed yet is because I think that there's a certain gap between like the actual practical solutions that you have and can have right now and the more idealistic solutions. So idealistically, a lot of people within DeFi or within crypto want decentralized types of solutions. We want a simple way to onboard users. We want a simple way to teach users. But at the same time, we don't want that to be a, a solution where you have to custody with some sort of centralized entity. And in practice, that is all that you can have right now. So, you know, even pretty much every exchange has done its best to make onboarding into crypto or getting out of crypto as simple as they can. But all of the exchanges are essentially centralized entities. And so you have disasters like FTX, where it, once you that trust is misplaced, that everyone gets destroyed. So, you know, our perspective of DeFi builders is like, we want to be able to do this from the trustless manner where you don't have these types of risks. And the like seemingly the possibility to do that is still very ephemeral and it's kind of looking for it right now. But, you know, there's like mixed solutions, which we're obviously at Alpaca exploring some ideas with this as well. And we have been for a long time, but it's definitely not simple because you have to touch a lot of areas. You have to touch the UX, you have to touch how exactly you're supposed to combine like Web 2 and Web 3. Because right now, even in DeFi, everything's living on Web 2 and then in interacting with Web 3, right? So we're still all accessing Web 3 protocols from Web 2 browsers, from our mobile phones on Safari or on wallets that are using like essentially Web 2 wrappers on top of websites. And so there's still a transition that needs to be made there in terms of these layers that we're accessing these protocols from. And it's very difficult to make that simple. You know, like, how do you have something like Robinhood where Robinhood doesn't own all the assets that you deposit there? And even, you know, if they don't own it, who owns it, right? So that means that you as the user own it. And as the user, that means that you need to know how to manage your assets in a safe way. Right. So that's the other hurdle. It's like, OK, even if we put the assets in the hands of the users, how do we teach them to manage the assets? You know, I don't see any type of magical solution. Maybe one day there will be. It's quite possibly something that's still going to take years for infrastructure to be built out for a certain minimum learning curve to exist, similar to how when computers and, you know, like iPads came out, people really just needed some time to learn the common patterns and from that, you were able to build stuff like Apple's UX, right, which is great, but you need to know like the common gestures for how mobile devices work and stuff like that to be able to use it comfortably. And I think DeFi is in a similar spot. It is always good to see a certain market segment in traditional finance to find some kind of product market fit. And perps have done that. I don't think perps really did that recently. I think it's been the case for a couple of years now that perps have been on that trajectory just because even since bitmax honestly like because it's really close to just trading normally so if you can have dexes you can have perps and obviously there's been some models that have done things a little bit differently but that it's essentially just an order book dex so but it's good to see it because perps are one of those areas that you can attract both big time investors if they're looking to hedge their exposure and you can attract smaller, newer investors that are just looking to get huge leverage because they're chasing 100x gains. So it's kind of an obvious product that is interesting ac across all kinds of users. And as far as options, these advanced derivative types of products, like what Pete mentioned, I still think we have time before we're able to get there, right? So problem with options, like I think we've talked about this before on these, is just the fragmented liquidity there. That's a hard problem to solve. It's really hard to solve in a sort of like DeFi type of way where you try to automate one type of liquidity provision from the entire user base, right? Maybe there is a solution that can work there, but at least so far I haven't seen it. And the demand so far hasn't really been there for options yet, right? But if you consider... So like what happened with, with Wall Street bets, right? So they kind of grew up an entire 
newer investor community around options. And you can definitely see that happening around crypto if they have a, a way to do it. So it, I think it is interesting. But I think at the end of the day, these are still a lot of what's coming out. It's not going to take crypto from like 1 million to 1 billion. You know, it's not going to be the 100x or 1000x increase. I shouldn't say crypto, DeFi specifically. And really the way that that's going to happen is that once we have some sort of simple way for the everyday user to interact with crypto without having to really touch smart contracts, but in a manner that's not completely centralized <laughs> like we have now, because you still have that gap. And that gap is evident when you try to get your money off of an exchange and interact with DeFi protocols, because DeFi protocols are fully Web3 there as much as they can be. And the exchanges are essentially fully Web2. So this is obviously you know something we'll keep watching on. I think the question a lot of people are wondering about isn't so much like the UX though, but the yields. So for whoever was fortunate enough to be around and using DeFi in 2020, it was really just kind of like walking through an amusement park or walking through a casino that had all kinds of deals and flashing lights all over the place because you just had these huge yields, huge returns everywhere, right? And obviously there was a the corresponding amount of risk there, but if you knew what you were doing, it was perfectly normal in 2020 and even through the two, first half of 2021 to be able to get triple digit returns w with reasonable safety, right? And and like in the future, you might be telling your grandkids about that. <laughs> and they're like, what? Like, I'm lucky to get negative 1% on my bank account now. And <laughs> you're talking about 200% returns. Yeah, that's how it was. And I think the question is, will that come back? I think it's going to be difficult to get it to that state. Certainly, I think the returns can increase a lot, especially if we hit a new bull, because the bull is kind of carrying the returns, right? So you're going to have a lot of companies and a lot of these returns are from the companies essentially giving away ownership in the company as rewards, as yield farming rewards and such. So you will have that. I don't expect for it to be as high but certainly higher than it is now. So, you know, that's going to happen and then it's going to drop again and so forth. But it's just kind of the cycle and how it goes. But DeFi isn't really the only space that everyone's watching, right? So NFTs and GameFi are obviously interesting. So besides for getting DeFi right, I think that there's still a discussion to be had about are we getting NFTs right? So I would say in terms of interest and user acquisition, NFTs are relatively easy to buy one, to touch it. But as far as like how exactly you unlock utility, how exactly you really keep engagement consistent, I think that's still the big problem that NFTs are trying to solve. And everyone sees this kind of cloud of a potential solution, but not exactly are able to grasp it or able to even describe it accurately, right? Like metaverse, all of that is in the same bucket for me. P, what do you think about NFTs, let's call it NFT Fi. Do you think that we can get it right? Are you seeing any current type of trends in that direction? So I think there's a lot of interest around the market get NFT Fi right. And there's a couple of areas that are coming to market at the moment. So I'll name off a couple. So there's like NFT liquidity from like a pseudo swap more like professional trading execution from like a blur. And then one interesting one on tracking this to see when they're in production, like how this works out, but T perps, which makes tons of sense. But to me, it just seems horribly risky, but through through NFT perp, right? There's also Bendow, which is doing lending and borrowing against NFTs, which I think probably has more of a, of a product market fit now, just because if you do happen to own art or stock or other assets, that's with a liquid or e-liquid at a high level, then you can basically borrow against those in a traditional setting. The issue really comes, I think like professional trading execution makes sense. If you're somebody who is a trader and you want that sort of visibility, then yes, for sure. When we start getting into liquidity, there's a couple of things that need, they need to bridge, I think. One generally is just the complexity of the current setup. So if you look at Pseudoswap, you need to have both sides of the equation, right? So there's no like single side currently, like let's say single side pools, let's say you want to bring capital and 
the other person wants to bring the NFT. So you need to have both and you need to have a quantity of both unless you're going into a single direction, right? Either just buying or just selling. It's also fairly complicated in terms of pool structure and how the pool changes as the pool is being interacted with. But someone shared with me a thread a couple of days ago on someone who did this with, I can't remember what, it was a Yuga Labs collection, a newer one, all the sewer passes. So it was something like, you know, five, six, seven hundred percent APR. And, you know, about, let's say, 25, 20, 25 K in trading fees. The one thing about the thread I found interesting, like most of these NFTs is that it was a very short period of time, right? So you have like a very short burst of trading activity and then potential fall off that could continue if the collection is still, you know, popular, but yeah, it's very short blip in time. And at the end of the day, you're still, if you're providing liquidity and there is a lot of interest to be market makers in the space, you're still effectively holding those NFTs, unless there's some sort of with these larger collections or call it firms. If let's say there's an agreement where you're a market maker, you, you use, let's say NFTs that are like extra that haven't been minted or have been minted, but haven't been sold and can use those alongside your ETH, then that could make sense. It makes sense. There's some sort of profit share, let's say. And, you know, this does go to like NFT liquidity. You could do a lot of different, you know, interesting and fun things if it's sustainable. It's hard for me to say, obviously, on bigger collections that have a large following. Yep, for sure. For newer collections, there are a couple of case studies out there that do show that it is profitable generally, regardless of where the price of the NFT goes, but it's very few and far between at the moment. And I think generally just a bit cumbersome in terms of setting up these pools. And you do need to have a decent amount of capital, A, to acquire the NFTs that say at Mint, you're likely not buying them off market if they're a good collection. And you need to have the ETH on the sideline to spin up these pools. So it may be more in line with other professional market makers or people with, you know, sort of deep pockets, but they're onto something. I don't think it's particularly like a, a model that will stick around what they have at the moment, but I did read somewhere a while back that I think Pseudoswap was integrating with Uniswap. So you can see kind of where the direction is going. So I think as it expands and as it comes more mature and let's see, you, you see more gaming assets or just assets in general, then yeah, you, you need that liquidity there. Otherwise, I think we kind of need to progress on from where the market is at the moment, which is like highly, highly speculative. And if we move to something that's a bit more, let's say, dynamic NFTs, I think that will continue. If there is like a intrinsic value, whether just kind of access or monetary going forward, the NFT perps, yeah, that'll be interesting to watch because from my experience with NFTs, it's like, you know, anyone I've ever bought over time, it's like trends to zero very quickly. <laughs> like I just don't have the inside knowledge everyone else does, right? So obviously this is going to be on top collections. It's not going to be on all of them, but to kind of build out that market, you do need to have, call it like a wide array of, of blue chips even though I'll counteract my first statement because the majority of volume on perps tend to be BTC and ETH. That's like 90% of the volume, I believe pretty well across the board, whether that's sex or dex perps. The other one, which is interesting is the bend down, right? So you can, you can borrow against people, people provide liquidity. I think the big incentive there was tokens coming from bend but the real bottleneck here, again, is liquidity because there was a time when the big collections were dropping in price. What was happening was, okay, the collateral ratio was hit and these NFTs need to be liquidated, but they have to be liquidated on effectively sort of like an open market. So who wants to buy them, right? And if they are not bought, then, you know, that position becomes bad debt quite quickly. So, you know, oh, I think liquidity is effectively the underpinning of these things because if you do have that right and do have deep liquidity, then all of a sudden, you know, money markets and let's say money market functions just much, much more clean and you don't require the other side to pick up the execution of the liquidation. But it, generally, I think everyone's quite bullish on this. And even, okay, you have obviously, you know, like large NFT projects, but as we move into a market where we have more, let's say gaming assets that have a value. So take, you know, something right now like CSGO skins, which do have a value outside of crypto or NFTs that people do use to do many different things. As that expands, then A, you need the liquidity there and B, there'll just be like way more demand. So I'm watching the space. I know I think capital sources are quite hot on, you know, can someone sort of get the, the model right in 
attract people, but the traditional market makers in crypto are looking at, okay, how can they do this in like a de-risked way? But there really isn't too much at the moment that has like hit that product market fit. And there's like a model that, you know, I think will kind of work long term. But yeah, Sam, do you think from, you know, outside of, let's say, liquidity and like, I'd say perps is almost kind of like a novelty in a way, like lending does have a mainstay. Are we missing anything generally from NFTs? And like, does this really matter to the casual user? Like, are they... Obviously, there's lots of speculation in NFTs, but as you kind of move, let's say, more into gaming assets, will we find a right fit for NFT Fi, or does it like really not matter that much to casual users? NFT Fi is just a speculation industry, right? So it's kind of like like let's take a look at art for a second. So you basically the majority of people who are interested in art, they're probably not interested in art to speculate. Yeah. So people are interested in art because of what art does. You know, when you look at a a piece of artwork, it's like one definition of art that I'll roughly say is art is meant to express something that can't easily be expressed in words. Right. So you might look at a piece of art or listen to a piece of music and then you're able to understand a concept. You're able to get a feeling or some sort of message from the creator that was either unable to be expressed in words or what was expressed more succinctly in a more or a more interesting way from art right and then you have a small percentage of people in the art industry who are usually at the top and really moving what's let's say the price aspect of art and i think right now so if you look at the nft market as a corollary most of the people in the NFT market couldn't care less what the art looks like, what the NFTs look like, right? So it's nice if they're cute or, but like realistically, some of the highest traded assets within the past couple of years have been like a, a rock JPEG. And so one of the narratives for that was the historical value of these NFTs is this and that. And okay, like that's, Maybe that's valid, meaning that the NFT market stabilizes and becomes huge in the future. But you're not really seeing a majority of the industry that's interested in NFTs because of what NFTs do. And that's the thing that people don't talk about that as much as they should, which is what exactly do NFTs do? So we come down just like what art does. You know, obviously you can say what art does, um, NFTs do, but that's not really the case because you don't need NFTs in their format of having a web three storage for a piece of art, you can just have digital art as a JPEG, right? So if you ask like, what do NFTs do? I think that at the same time is underrepresented as I've just said, but at the same time, it should be, there is actually more potential to unearth than people realize. So for me, if you'd really think down like decades down the line, where a game, FI, NFTs, crypto, intersect, you really have to have a vision of what other technologies are going to accomplish. So if you think about the metaverse, if you think about virtual reality, if you think about going even further down the line, but like brainwave interfaces, so like the microchips that Elon is working on essentially, and most recently, the one that really pops up is AI. So if you think about AI, okay, let's take AI as an example and and get to how AI can unearth unlock the utility of NFTs and digital assets in general. So let's say that AI becomes more powerful, becomes smarter, and essentially it becomes the equivalent of employees within a business, right? It becomes the equivalent of participants within an economy, within an industry. At that point, you have to really like to think about the second and third order effects of AI and ask yourself, how are AI entities going to interact with other AI entities? How are are they going to interact with businesses? How are they going to interact with humans? And the only answer you can come to is digital assets, right? So if you understand in order for AI to actually be more autonomous, they need to have a way to essentially buy and sell things. Right. They obviously can't go to the store. They can't go to Wall Street. But you know what? So they need some way to have a store of value. They need some way to be able to authenticate themselves in terms of what they are useful for, what the AI has done in the past. 
And when you really think about that, you have the solution for these things right now. So in the broader sense, the solution is digital assets. And in the narrower sense, you can say, if we look at like proof of authority NFTs that for example, can show that a certain AI has achieved mastery, just like on LinkedIn, you get badges or whatever, you know, for passing courses. That is really the solution that is most natural fit here for AI and, and for these kinds of entities, right? So I think the utility aspect is really what's necessary in order for NFTs to gain sustainability that isn't just based on people trying to speculate on these assets. And I don't know how many years we are away from that. It could be two years, it could be a decade away. But I think once these other technologies really come into place, that's when you're going to see NFTs specifically get real mainstream adoption where your, your father or your uncle might have to touch this technology, even though they could care less about monkey JPEGs, right? Because for them, maybe they're running a business and they're going to get priced out of competition if they don't touch these AI tools or take advantage of something like ChatGPT as an assistant. And in order to do that, they need to essentially work on the payment layer and on the authentication layer. And that's going to require digital assets, it's going to require NFTs in different formats. And I think that's really what is going to make the difference here. So NFT Phi, I don't really think NFT Phi is very important. I think NFT utility is going to be what's important for NFT specifically. Crypto is a different story, right? So crypto was Phi from the start. So we can say that the finance aspect of crypto is important. And GameFi, it's pretty much in the same boat as NFTs. So GameFi is like a mix of crypto and a mix of NFTs. But at the end of the day, people play games to play games. They want to have fun. Stuff like digital ownership is really secondary. And gaming is going to need the same type of utility use cases to really explode. Until it has that, you're going to have a similar situation where it's really speculation that is propping it up. But in the long term, I absolutely am a believer that at the synergy of these almost inevitable technology shifts that we're going to have a bigger place for game fine for NFTs. So, you know, kind of like some big broad strokes here, but I think that is what we're looking at. So that's kind of a, probably enough of the head in the clouds conversation. I think there's still stuff that we need to do on a day to day basis as people in the industry to really even be successful in, in getting to that point before getting destroyed by, by our own ignorance. So here's one thing that's been coming up recently, right? So protocols closing down. I think the longer the bear market goes, the more you're clearly going to see this happen with protocols that you previously thought were household names that were successful, essentially wrapping up their work. And they don't even need to get hacked. In some cases, it's just the founding team loses motivation it could be that some service or infrastructure provider they were using closed down. So recently, a big one is Friction, which was on Solana. And they were interesting because they were actually doing some cool experimental stuff with derivative financial products that really were underrepresented within DeFi. And they pretty much just like shut down, right? So they're actually a competitor to Alpaca in terms of the smart vault segment, which if you don't know what that is, you can read our recap article that was just posted yesterday that goes over that a little bit. But this kind of thing is obviously not really great to watch for a user. And what you're going to see is what you're going to be hearing about is some protocols that essentially are abandoning their user base or potentially even worse, right? So Pete, what do you think about that and closing down? Or what do you think about just protocols winding down in general? Is there anything that users need to watch out for here? Yeah, this one kind of came out of nowhere, right? During they raised, I think a couple million bucks. No, it was around like five and a half million a year ago. So the question really is, if you're looking at a protocol like this, obviously if it's a protocol that is generating yields Typically, that speaks to a certain type of investor, I would say, that are actually using the protocol. So it did have, I think, two or three billion in sort of volume and a good amount of TVL, I think 100, 150 mil. So not small by any means. It's difficult because on the surface, like you look at, okay, Solana DeFi has obviously gotten, generally gotten hammered since FTX. And just generally, like it's dropped a lot. It's probably what, maybe 
250 million at the moment in terms of like overall TBL. So it's taken a huge hit, but I wouldn't have expected this to happen because yeah, if you raise five and a half million, obviously their investors may be saying, okay, great. You need to give us back the money. And, you know, generally this is maybe a more favorable outcome than the soft rug, which is basically just the team just bleeding out the protocol until there's nothing left. Fun little story is that that's basically what OpenSea was doing, right? So prior to like the big NFT kickoff, someone who know them personally mentioned that, okay, well, there's basically no traction in NFTs. We are just basically going to bleed out the reserves until we have nothing left and then call it a day and move on to something else. And then the NFT market popped and now look at them. So is probably a better outcome than like the soft rug scenario them just saying well listen there's just not enough runway obviously it depends if you know users if they can pull out their funds i imagine a lot of them maybe aren't paying close attention especially smaller ones if they have a small amount on but yeah it kind of goes to like you know, how do you effectively what is the right protocol to unwind these projects right i'd say the majority in this case probably just kind of ride it out until they no longer can. And there has been, you know, larger projects that we've known of that, you know, we would call basically zombie projects as well, where yes, there's still activity, but they, the development has fundamentally stopped. So they're not shipping new products. They're not, you know, updating infra. They're just basically, you know, steady as she goes. And there's, you know, just basically call it max ex extraction coming from the protocol. So yeah, it is a bit of a surprising one. They, they obviously, if I haven't looked at token price, which I'm sure is just abysmal, but that's the issue, right? If they could pause all things equal and effectively say to their users and to their investors, say, well, listen, we can't continue like this, so we have to wind it down, then that's fine. But if you get the info first or if you get the, an info a week later and you find out the token price has dropped, you know, basically 100 percent because the team just can't be bothered, then that's a huge loss a, for the community and obviously for just general use, which isn't good. So how do you do that? Difficult to say. So I've been seeing a number of different things pop up, you know, recently of people pissed off with, let's say, DAOs that are kind of doing the same thing as a soft rug where they're just using, you know, treasury. It's meant to be put to good use to basically, you know, go to conferences and, and fly around. But. That's a totally different story, I would say. And it's also, I've seen this this week with Confia, which is a bit different than like a wind down, but generally not great for the industry when you have, so Confia, if, if nobody knows them, they were the ones that were effectively building out a lot of the Cosmos, call it like public good development. So a lot of work on IBC, on like smart contracts, your Cosm Wasm, plus others. And they're just like, yeah, listen, we're going to stop this, right? Which isn't, great for the industry as a whole. Because if you do give a clear sort of exit or a way to effectively wind down a protocol, then I think you'd see way more bad actors that would do like a more elaborate, like our founder died, therefore we, our NFT collections, you know, can't be launched. If, if, if the community wants to take it over, then great, if anyone remembers that. But yeah, it, it's something that generally... I don't think there is an answer for at the moment. Because if you give a clear exit, then there'll be more bad actors. But if there's no real way to kind of wind down something that is fundamentally, let's say, not profitable, then, you know, like any company, the sooner that you can make, call it, make everyone whole as humanly possible. In this case, you can call them everyone investors, whether it's retail or if it's investors, then that's better, right? But I think generally particularly in this environment, it happens, you know, much more than, than you think. And that could be from, yes, the product's still being used, but they're no longer shipping new products or updating infra, or they're just basically bleeding the reserves out until there's no more because they might have hit the wrong cycle. So for example, for, you know, say firms that raised a small amount and then hit a bear market and didn't get the traction or the users, then it's very difficult because the users and most of the TVL is fundamentally left. And as we talked about at the start of the fireside is that, you know, a lot of the capital, whether it's retail or institutional, is basically sitting on the sidelines still in all markets to see how a lot of this plays out. But we're not going to have the right way to do this because I think if we do have someone set some sort of framework, then it opens up for exploitation. So anyone that's in these communities, you have to watch out for the signs of people that, you know, say, devs or the protocol is not releasing roadmaps or not putting resource to good use to find new avenues to attract TVL or revenue or user growth. But you have to be quite hands-on in these environments. It can't be spread too thin because this is probably likely to happen to 
to more than it is to less. I'll just quickly add something on the topic. So OpenSea didn't have a token, right? If I'm not mistaken. So in their case, them like just kind of bleeding out until they got lucky enough to hit it big wasn't that bad because at the end of the day, they're not really misrepresenting any important stakeholders. So their users, as long as the service is functioning, can continue using it, right? And a soft drug is really when you have investors and they're holding assets that are dropping in value that they can get rid of, but they're not getting rid of it because you as the protocol team have not communicated your stance on essentially stopping working on the protocol. So they just watch as the token prices drop. And during this time, usually the protocol team is just selling the tokens on the market and getting whatever they can get out of it. So that's the definition of a soft drug because OpenSea didn't have a token, any of their investors were not able to exit essentially. So it wasn't really a soft drug, more as just, you know, a dying project. When you look at something like friction, so they raised quite a bit of money and then they closed down within a year of that raise. That's kind of like, how did you use all the money? So that's the question I'm sure that everyone and their investors are asking. Probably the answer is going to be bad operational management where they just didn't budget out the funds that they had for at least a two year period. Like that's what you have to do. Right. And a lot of crypto projects just don't have professional people. So you end up with a situation like this where even though the project was doing decently well, should have had some revenues during that time. They just like maybe the staff was grossly overpaid like it's hard to say maybe they just quit with some of the money in the bank but i yeah like pizza i don't consider that too bad because at least they did announce it what you often see the vast majority of the time in crypto is projects that have a token that's publicly on sale and then you just watch it drop like from 100 to zero and the project doesn't come out with updates maybe they'll update their twitter but no real like work on GitHub or anything. And this is just like ever present in crypto could because there's no punishment for it. So even really when I say there's no punishment for it, I'm even talking about KYC teams. And you'll see teams that without much shame put on their portfolios that they worked, put on their like new projects that, you know, they're formerly from these two other projects. If it didn't go completely horrendously and you look at those two other projects in detail and they soft drugged out, right? So that's just kind of how it goes. That is the the bad case, but you're going to see a lot more of this, a lot more of projects really having this kind of situation because people just can't stand the grind. And that's what we're going to have now, unless we really get a, a huge breakout, which I'm still skeptical about, you know, then we're going to have a grind. That's the alternative breakout or grind, in my opinion. And grind includes the scenario where you know, Bitcoin price drops still quite a bit, but I think definitely one of the most realistic scenarios is another one year period, two years period where these builders have to kind of just keep building without any type of real growth and even a, a contraction. And a lot of people can't take that, right? Especially if they're younger. So you'll have project teams just soft drug or you'll have them just quit and even just not want to work on it anymore. So Friction's a, one of the recent ones, but it's not going to be the last one. And I think there was an earlier comment about PTSD. I do not think we've hit the peak of PTSD. You know, PTSD is not the bottom of the market. It's not when you have your first few major nightmares. PTSD is when you have to live with that for five years, right? So it's the time. It, PTSD is when you realize that's not going away. And then you don't know if it's ever going to stop. And that's basically the despair point. So that's across that journey is when you're going to have more and more people quitting, right? It's not when it's hardest. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we are lucky enough to have a very short bear market. Hopefully, there is some sort of reason for confidence to come back in and get a lot of that liquidity on the side. But there are definitely some macro headwinds. So yeah, we'll be watching it. And I think at this stage, this call has gone on pretty long. So we'll jump to Q&A. And if anyone has any question about anything we've discussed or about Alpaca or its products, feel free to press the request button at the bottom left of the app and we'll take your question. So let's give that half a minute or so. Okay, we'll take a couple of questions from the Ask Alpaca Bank, which is the bank of questions collected from our users in our socials across the past two weeks. So first question is, when will we be able to see Alpaca's roadmap for 2023? 
we just updated the roadmap so you can check it out right now and 2023 is filled out so if you have any questions about that just hop on our socials second question is will there be automated vaults 2.0 released after the launch of af 2.0 or will the current automated vaults remain the same so arguably we've already launched 2.0 we haven't branded it that way we wanted to see what the result would be but uh, the improvements we did with repurchasing and with the ai incorporation were really a, a 2.0 level of improvement but as far as the next version which is essentially automated vaults on top of af 2.0 that's currently scheduled in the roadmap for q3 it's possible we do it sooner if the enough liquidity moves over from alpaca 1.0 to 2.0 in a fast enough time frame such that it makes sense to move over the avs sooner than that but currently scheduled for q3 Okay, someone has a question. Hi, Jonathan, you're up. Hey, Sam. Yeah, I was wondering if you can maybe give us a little bit of insight in what trading pairs are going to be launching on the perps and what will be the future consideration for launching any further pairs. Thank you. Sure. So we looked at protocols both on other chains and also on BNB chain to look where the volume was. And the majority of volume is on Bitcoin and Ethereum. Not too surprisingly. And then obviously BNB is going to be of interest. So we're going to have that. And I think those are really three big ones that you can capture 95 to 99% of the volume at the moment. Now we have on our roadmap for the perps, I believe it's in Q3 or Q4, the potential to have additional assets even like synthetic assets representing parts of the traditional markets. And that's something that's going to require a more complicated type of risk management around pricing for those assets. So that's definitely not something we're looking to launch too early. And so pretty much that's it. Like the biggest tokens are what we're going to serve long short in the beginning. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I would very much be up for reworld assets on Alpaca Perps. Just allow me a quick follow-up question. Is there any mechanism in place in which people can vote for that? Is that going to be the subject of governance? I would imagine there's going to be a lot of people shilling their bags by wanting them to get listed on Alpaca Perps, which would be fine if they have some way of paying for it or having to buy Alpaca to vote it into existence. Yeah, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the plans for that. Yeah, so the let, let's first talk about the fundamental restriction of what it would take to add a new token, right? So the way that this is going to work is that you're going to have a liquidity pool of all of the tokens that are available in the platform together. So you're going to have Bitcoin, Ethereum, BNB, BUSD. And if you add a new token, it needs to get added to that pool. So what happens is that you're exposing all of the liquidity providers to that new token which essentially means you need to have a much higher level of confidence in that token's ability to maintain a reasonable price with low volatility and to be a long-term token, right? So if you can't just put in like small coin number five, because what's going to happen is that if the price of that token drops, it's literally going to pull down all of the other ones with it and it's going to affect everyone. So at least with our current model, before we introduce you know, something like synthetics, which might work off of a different model, it's going to be a very high bar to add any type of additional token to that batch. But if we do add one, I suspect it could be something like we've been doing for Alpaca, for LYF, where principally the team is always on the lookout for something that can generate revenue for the platform. But at the same time, anyone can make a suggestion in governance, really like just make a discussion. And if it gets enough interest, it has the potential to move to a proposal to add the token. But in my opinion, I think it's going to be tough, at least in the current market. I don't see another token that would be able to stand the test here. Thanks so much, Sam. You're welcome. Okay, we have another question. Hey, Doc, you're up. Awesome. Hey, thanks. I have a question if there's any thoughts about going into other protocols or DEXs that have the targeted liquidity options so you could look at things like what Gamma Protocol does so that you could look for delta neutral strategies like what you're doing in the automated vaults, but where you can shift around the area where you're providing liquidity to kind of improve the gains around that in some sort of automated fashion. Pete, are you familiar with that protocol? Maybe 
you'd be better at answering this question than me. Gamma, not enough. I haven't dug into Gamma enough yet, apart from just like the general context of like trading volatility or turning permanent loss positive. But no, I haven't dug enough into that yet, Doc, to kind of give you a clear answer. And I'll do a bit more when they fully launch and see what products they, they launch with. So is it basically a concentrated liquidity like on Uniswap V3? Yeah, that's it. And then you move that around to stay within the, you know, the active trading range. I think they just integrated Polygon and then they're, I, know, I think they're with Uniswap but as well. But I mean, you don't necessarily have to have Gamma to do it. Gamma is just a protocol to enable that in other protocols. So, Okay, so the one that I'm aware of that's the biggest one is Arrakis that does that on uni v3 i haven't looked at gamma so i don't know specifically what they do besides for the like il hedging or whatever so essentially on bnb chain you don't have currently you don't have a major dex that offers concentrated liquidity so we don't have the possibility of an integration at the moment because there's nothing to integrate on but Recently, Uniswap v3 announced and passed a governance vote, at least the first of one of the two required, that they will be moving to BNB chain. So once Uniswap v3 is on BNB chain, we will have the potential to integrate on top of them. And at that point, we'll be able to offer leverage yield farming, automated vaults on top of Uniswap v3. And our automated vaults have the ability to basically move around like the liquidity or rebalance the liquidity is more accurate to say. And if we add an additional layer of logic that for a concentrated liquidity where the range changes, that would be essentially like a new sub project, I would say, to make that work on Uni V3. So it's not an area we've dived in just because the board is not set yet for us to really look into that, but I don't see a reason why not. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Okay, that's going to be it for today's call. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. So if you missed any of this call, it'll be up on YouTube or Spotify. And you might be able to listen to it on as a recording on Twitter as well, some a short time after this ends. But we'll have our next chat in about two weeks, as we always do. So thank you, everyone, for joining us and have a great week. Thanks, everyone.